Welcome to another Melbourne Cocoa Heads presentation, recorded at the offices of J-Tribe, June 16th, 2011. In this session, David Kennedy and Scott Manley of Dangerous Pixels discuss their journey in building an iOS development consultancy, as well as their own application, Task Caddy. Uh, so, we've um, actually changed the topic a little bit from what Sean might have advertised um, when, <laughs> when we first uh, planned this. And so, we were originally going to talk about the evolution of our, our app, uh, our only app in the store at the moment, um, Task Caddy. We've, and, um, but that hasn't evolved as much because we're, we're primarily a consultancy and we'll, we'll get to that. But so uh, we've been mainly working on client work. And so we'll, we'll show you a bit about that. But, uh, but also we've decided to really pitch it more as we've set ourselves up as an iOS consultancy. As Sean says, we're a relatively new business. Um, and so we thought it might be interesting for people if we talk just a bit about that journey and, um, and I guess at the end open it up nice and early for a bit of Q&A about you know, how other people have found that, that journey for themselves as well. So I thought we'd start with sort of just a background slide and a dangerous photo of Dave and I up there. So um, basically uh, Dave's 10 years uh, in IT, bit of uh, mostly here in Australia, but also worked in the UK and the States for a while. Dave's got more of a background in, in UI design, and uh, we'll talk a bit about the separation of roles um, in, a, in a later slide, but also played around with some video, professional video stuff for a while, but Rails developer for a while, but we met when um, Dave was doing Enterprise Java. And I guess that's my background as well. So 15 years in the in the industry, despite my youthful appearance, but um, but uh, moved into sort of a technical project manager role, and so that's sort of the role I play at the moment with the with the company. So we thought we'd talk a bit about why we decided to start this this business. Obviously, there's a bunch of other consultancies um, out out in this area, but also we you know were were uh, in paid employment, you know, um, had had consistent income and things like this. Uh, you know, why why in the hell would we uh, would we do this? And so, firstly, we were both long time Mac Mac and iOS fans um, and users. So bought bought power books back in the day, and um, and you know haven't obviously haven't gone back. But we're also you know uh, very early users of um, of iPhone and and iPad. In terms of it being a consultancy, we were consultants already, so I think we had a lot of the skills to um, that that were required to actually make that um, make the business we thought a success and, and be competitive in that space. But um, primarily, the reason was because we saw probably as a lot of people in the room today have seen that here was sort of an exciting new type of application development that was um, was evolving. And so, you know, you see the iPad and the iPhone and the types of software that was being written for these things. And um, and so it was really an opportunity to, I guess, throw away a lot of the stuff we'd been dealing with in the past and take a new look at, at how, we, uh, how we developed and designed a solution for a customer. So... But we finally we felt we could bring something uh, to this space as well, independent from other people, and we'll talk a bit about that as an idea um, later. So what do we do? As I mentioned, we're primarily a consulting company. So uh, iPhone and iPad app development. Also in the consulting area, we've got this idea, and we've not really done that much of this but i think it's going to be an evolving space is this idea that a lot of companies out there probably don't um, know how to best use these new these new uh, products uh, these new devices they're used to web they're used to desktop but yeah how how should they best engage with this and so looking at assisting organizations with how how to actually do that um, but we also develop a few of our own uh, products as well, and we'll talk a bit more about Task Caddy and some of the other things we've got, um, some of the other goals we've got for a product development. In terms of getting started, uh, we thought we'd just briefly talk about, you know, in terms of starting an iOS consultancy, what we think was important for us as, as things we should consider. Firstly, you know, you need, you need goals. Um, 
for in order to be able to say uh, how, is this working or not. So, um, yeah, we've we've been running six months now, basically, as as a serious um, is as in treating it seriously, and so we've sort of drawn that as a bit of a line in the sand for us to say, okay, you know, are we making enough? Um, but also, you know, are we do we still have a life? You know, are we still um, seeing our wife and kids and whatever. Hello, Dave. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> not that he knows of. So, um, so, uh, but the, the 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 next point is really why should we exist? So, you know, if you can't answer how how you think you're different or better than other businesses out there, and by this I don't mean you know where um, we can develop every um, solution better than another business, but it's more. Um, can you bring something else to the to the industry and potentially partner with others? And we we believe we're successfully doing this at the moment. So, um, but you need to understand the style of business that you're after as well, and so what types of customers you're going for, going after, and and have that consistent style. We had to answer the question, was it, you know, we're going to take uh, venture capital or anything like that. Um, we had offers from, from uh, business contacts we had to sort of set up people that wanted to get into this space, but due to, you know, our desire to have complete control over the direction of the business, we've, we've decided against that ourselves, but um, it's obviously a, a, an issue people have got to face. Um, but also, you've got to have a strategy for letting you, people know you exist. And so, we've decided to not, and we don't, and I'll talk a bit more about um, our, the, the sort of marketing strategy and what we think has worked and what hasn't worked uh, later in the presentation. But, you know, very much we've gone with the approach of just letting people know we exist, letting people know um, how we do things. And I guess, you know, thanks to you guys, an, an opportunity like this to to do that type of thing, and um, yeah, we're happy to chat, happy to have a chat about that at the end of the, at the end of the presentation. So, um, in terms of how we've structured our business, uh, it's sort of logically fallen into our, our backgrounds, I guess. As I said, Dave, in terms of that design background, um, and me in terms of the project management experience, and so, but with both having sort of a good technical foundation, and I guess that that split, and I think it's actually interesting that a lot of businesses um, in this space seem to have a similar sort of split and you know, I think there's no doubt um, in the iOS space you do need to be serious about the sort of UI design process and, and uh, having, having things looking and uh, usable in order to uh, create good solutions. How we work, um, so we've, these are the things we felt were important. Um, as, as part of setting up the business. So we, we placed a strong emphasis on sort of project and client management. And uh, so what I mean by this is not, you know, huge, huge processes and things like that, but we do a lot of fixed price work in um, as a consultancy. And so it's very important for both us and the client that we know exactly how, um, how the project's running and whether it's on track. Um, analysis and UI design, obviously with, again, with Dave's strength in that particular area, we spent a lot of time with the client working out, um, making sure that we both understand what's, what's going to be delivered and Dave will talk in detail about our, our, um, our approach for that later. Both got um, technical backgrounds, as I mentioned, and uh, obviously that's a strength being able to go into um, into other consultancy, uh, into other organisations and dealing with different environments. The, uh, one of the key um, issues here though I think um, for, and probably this is again consistent for everybody here, is that this idea that you know we found you, you've got to avoid this sort of race to the bottom, you know, if you, if you get involved in that you're really going to be, you, you're going to be get beaten every time by sort of offshore developers and things like that, so you need to be able to provide that quality solution um, in order to be able to provide that value add, and so what I, you know, the usability, performance, you know, graphic design, those types of key things that that really make a difference to the application. Uh, just briefly on on project management, you know, this is probably something that a lot of people don't 
um, certainly I didn't as a technical um, person think a lot about. As I was saying, I, I sort of got really hardened in this area doing enterprise Java work and really understood how much it can cost the business if you don't get this sort of stuff right. And so one of the things we do as part of um, as part of our process up front is basically to get agreed with the client, like we say, we do a lot of fixed price work, um, is you know, getting everything agreed, who, what, who's, who's on this team, um, what, what are the deliverables, and, and the, this idea of getting a shared understanding of what is meant by this deliverable. And we all understand, we all live in the real world, we all understand things are, are going to change, but you at least need to start with that foundation and that shared understanding with the client of, of what you're actually going to be doing as part of the project and what represents completion. So that idea of, okay, is this actually done? Um, and the other thing is, is uh, having a process in place for identifying and controlling risk. So, you know, if something's going wrong, um, often you'll have this niggling feeling in the back of your mind or whatever. You owe it to yourself if, if this is your project and your money. You, you need to be able to uh, deal with that in some way and uh, that's certainly one of the things we've, we've learnt um, you know, and I've learned the hard way uh, over years of project management. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it hand it over to Dave, who's going to talk about the uh, sort of our requirements and UI design process. Thanks, hey, Scott. Um, so, I mean, as one of the things that I mean we're all familiar with here um, is how to get these. You know, a project comes up, how hey, you're going to get to that point where you can actually deliver a solution. Um, one of the things I'm keen to talk about is how we're approaching it. Um, and we're also pretty keen to see how you guys are handling this as well. Um, so one of the, starting up, one of the first things we got was um, an email from a guy, um, and probably like most people here, we had to sign an NDA, um, which is tremendous for your marketing. Uh, you can't say anything about it. And what we can say is that uh, it's a, quite a complex app in the medical space. Um, no one's doing anything like it out there at the moment, um, which is great, and we'd love to be able to talk about it, but it's you know not good for marketing. Um, but as one of those things that we do in the process that we're kind of using here is we'll start off, we'll go up with a client interview, and so try and gather you know some questions. That's a very focused kind of ask a lot of questions, try and draw out those requirements. Um, and obviously you've got to change these kind of processes depending on your clients. Like we've worked with development companies, we've worked with people who have no development experience and we're working with other iOS developers. So a lot of this stuff, you know, we're not trying to teach you guys how to suck eggs, but it's, you do have to change that level of stuff depending on who you're talking to. Um, another thing we found that's really good is an on-site observation. So as part of that, uh, and particularly for this one client, Given the complexity of the app, we actually went up, asked him some questions, asked him what he wanted to do, and then we actually gave him an iPad and said, right, now pretend you've got the iPad and show us when you're going to pick it up, when you're going to put it down, and that's a good opportunity to really kind of read between the lines and read those subtitles because, again, like, you know, when, as we all know, when you're talking to clients, what comes out of the mouth, you really kind of go, well, I'm reading what, what actually needs to happen there. Um, we found that really good. From that, we'll try and build up some user stories, some use cases, um, and we'll kind of feed that back to the client just to make sure that we've taken everything down and talking about the issues at that point. This is when you start to get into kind of designing that user experience. Obviously, everyone wants that beautiful user experience with these iPhone and iPad stuff. So, um, and the next kind of points, you know, come into that building a good UI flow going through some sketches, wireframes, and of course getting to, it's all about getting real, like all these processes are, you know, you're kind of trying to mitigate the risk at each point to get to that next step, and obviously the sooner you can get to that, but you don't want to rush into that and then eat it in development time. So, what do we call a UI flow? Um, obviously, most of us, I think, have all come from a pretty big web background. Um, if you're into Rails, you surely know who these guys are, 37 Signals. Um, I've been reading their stuff for a long time, it's great. And one of, the, one of the really big posts that I read over the last few years was this shorthand for UI flows. And 
I've had tremendous use out of this from a web point of view, but I think it's even more important from a mobile point of view, given the nature of the device, how people use it. You know, it's got to be really functional and really like every UI element on that screen needs to have its functionality validated. Um, it's not like the web where you can get a bit lazy and you can throw things on. Um, so basically, if, if you're not familiar with it, I mean, and again, this kind of documentation, like you don't get technical about it. We're not talking about complex flow charts with different types of diagrams for things and that. Like, it's, it's all, it's all going to be thrown away eventually. Um, <laughs> but basically, the gist is that, like, you draw a line on the top there, what the user sees or the screen, and then list some actions below. You draw an arrow to another screen where it's what the user sees and the actions can go from that. So. To take you through an example, so obviously Task Caddy is one of the products we decided to um, build. Obviously we picked the simplest um, idea that we had to build as a product and obviously because simple is very hard. And so here you go, is an example of like a list, add task, task detail, obviously that would pop up. Here are all the functions we can do on that screen there and that just follow this, this flow through. And I find that this particularly like Depending on the client you're talking to, often they come to you with a, a bit of a UI mock-up of what they want. And you'll see a lot of web UI in there, you'll see a lot of varied UI. Um, and often it doesn't quite flow as well. And I've found a like, really successful process with clients is to go, look, that's great. We'll look at that and we'll reverse engineer something like this out of that. And it really helps them focus on the functionality of what the device has to do at each point and why you're doing it. When we feel we've got that down enough, um, uh, we move to like a quick, you know, kind of sketch of a UI thing. Um, we've got some wicked little stencils, uh, UI stencil, if you've seen those, um, they're pretty good. Uh, and again, we kind of, spending that time getting that UI flow correct helps really drive this. And I think that separation there is, is quite good um, in focusing uh, what the UI has to look like at each point. And then of course, as another, as the next step in the pro oh, the next step of the process also, um, we may look to a digital wireframe here, like we use Illustrator. Um, we found particularly with the complex apps, if you need to flick on a lot of layers, if you've got to generate a lot of screens, sometimes it makes sense to move away from the pencil when you feel like you're comfortable enough and you've got it down. Flick to something where you can get layers. And the, the beauty of this is you can get pretty pixel accurate here and you can get a, a more accurate um, idea of how much screen real estate you've got. Because when you're in the pencil and paper, you're kind of drawing quickly and you kind of draw it and then you're not really sure whether actually do I have that amount of screen real estate and is that going to be scrolled off the bottom or something like that. And the beauty here is you can really say, right, that top bar, 44 pixels high for the iPhone 3G, you know, double it, everything for the iPhone 4, get those through. Again here though, um, we try and keep things very black and white, don't introduce much gloss. Um, a good thing, one good advantage of doing things is you can make things look like buttons and stuff like that. Occasionally we've found clients get confused about what is that, is that a button or is that a UI segment control, like is that a little tab thing? Um, and you can make that a bit clearer here. But again, the idea is to avoid use of color and distraction at that point. But basically, once we've got that, we'll then take the UI flow and our designs and sit down with the client and do like step by step. And it becomes like a checklist. And we found that's also quite good in that making sure that you've, you've ticked it all off, it's a bit more real for the client. They can see that they've got that detail there. Um, and you can also, kind of really help mitigate that risk of, of you know, getting to development stage and realise, oh, there's got to be an email button on this screen and that's got to, what, email something which you haven't catered for. We've all been there. Um, and then, of course, we move to a working prototype as soon as possible. Um, here's a very early working prototype of Task Caddy, which I hadn't seen in a while and looks quite terrible. Um, and then we've had great success using TestFlight as well um, in pushing those prototypes to the client again is another next step. Um, the kind of next big challenge we've, we've had is graphic design. Um, when we started out, we worked with a, a graphic designer. Um, he'd done a lot of websites, 
Uh, he was pretty good, and we were very happy with his work. Like he did our logo, um, and we'd still work with him again. But we tried him for the mobile stuff, and that was a terrible experience. Um, we found that educating the graphic designers on what and what they can't change, and they tend to go a bit mental and just try and change everything, and then you get it back and you go, can't do that. Um, so we went through a number of designs, but I think as a general kind of thing, it's quite early for graphic designers. We found it quite difficult to find to find people who really know about the stuff. Like they seem to know the web quite well, and they know what they can do, and they know what they can get away with. But mobile is quite different. Um, so I myself am a bit of a frustrated designer trapped in a programmer's body, and so that kind of ended up being a bit of a mishmash of what we got from the graphic designer and what I did. Um, so eventually we got Taskcaddy version 1 in the store uh, as a bit of a soft release, but we weren't quite happy with it. Um, so we thought we'd try something different. And we hired this guy. Um, this, uh, this guy is actually Eddie Zammett. Um, and he runs the world's only desktop publishing dedicated to t-shirt graphic design. Um, and this guy ran a graphic design company for a number of years, very successful internationally. Um, and we kind of employed him as a creative director. And probably the, the most valuable thing he told us, like given this guy works with all the big, large companies like uh, uh, you know all the t-shirt companies, Zoo York, Stussy and all that, and works with all those top designers. A um, lot of experience, he said, basically, look, you've got to find the right graphic designer for the job. They've all got their own strengths and weaknesses, and this was certainly our experience. And he says, look, you know, you've got to choose the right guy for the right job. And um, so he basically uh, found us a guy in the UK who he said was pretty good once we gave him a spec. And this is the kind of stuff we gave to the graphic designer. We kind of learned our lesson and produced this document where it kind of tore apart the elements. We had a pretty big, pretty big Word document there, um, which went through all the screens in the app, and then we broke it down about how we actually built that to the graphic designer. And that as a process was pretty good in conveying what and what they can't do, what heights are everything. And this is where the Illustrator file, if you've got to it, becomes an excellent starting base for a graphic designer because it's it's more real for them. They get a they get an Illustrator file. Everything's pixely correct. They've got a really good starting base, and you're going to get less. You still will get, they will still want to change the tab bar down the bottom, um, which is a nightmare. But, and despite, despite tearing that apart in many times, they still do miss it occasionally. But we found this second iteration, we were very quickly able to get to something that we were happy with. And so eventually we came to Task Caddy 2.0. We got a, uh, a stronger logo. Um, which we're quite happy with. We've got a pretty good graphic design. This is a little bit more in line with our original vision for, for Taskcaddy. Um, and there's some good things too, like um, that the graphic designer sent through, like the plus button up the top there from a usability point of view, having that different color really highlights that on the screen. Like you can't quite see it as well on here, but um, of course the SDK doesn't allow you to just set the color of that button. You have to move to a custom button. but um, again, that's one of those calls where you hire these guys, they give you the graphic design advice, and they were spot on, and so it's worth the extra coding effort, I think, to go that extra level to get that kind of stuff. But we were really happy with that. Um, and so we've been building up, as we've been working hard on client apps, trying to get this product out the door. Um, and then, of course, uh, two weeks ago, this thing happened. Um, <laughs> and so uh, that, that Tuesday morning, because you know, obviously a startup, we couldn't really justify spending the ticket to go to WWDC. Um, we felt a bit like this, um, <laughs> where we thought, well, we've just done all this effort to get this up and up and running, and we're we're at the final stages of, of task caddy, and we're about to push it out. But then by the end of the day, we kind of started to feel a little bit like this. <laughs> and it's more really well. Task Caddy, we build something for ourselves. Um, 
We built an app that we wanted to use. Um, it's not like we didn't have competitors before, like it's a pretty, pretty big space. There's a lot of people out there in this kind of simple task management um, app, uh, albeit Apple is a pretty big, serious competitor in that now, and it's pretty hard to compete with free. Um, but uh, I think the, the thing for us, um, rightly or wrongly, we held off on releasing uh, or pushing it for reviews to a lot of sites because we knew it wasn't quite there and we knew, look, we're going to push it off and we're going to get, they're going to trash it because we can see what's wrong with it. We know it's not quite there. Um, we got version one out really as kind of like a proof of capability. And I think as a consultancy, that really helped us. Like, I'm not really sure whether it was a coincidence. I don't think it was. But the day after we pushed Task Editor to the store, we won, you know, one of these other jobs which we'd been going for, which was a bit iffy. And so don't underestimate that proof of capability getting it into the store. Um, and it's still an app that shows uh, our ideals and what we look for from a quality point of view in an app. And showing that kind of stuff to the client is, um, is, is very valuable. And obviously, we learned um, a tremendous, about, tremendous amount about the process. Um, cut our teeth, you know, learning code as well. Um, you know, getting the whole graphic design process, what you can do. Um, and uh, it's probably a good point to pass on to Scotty for the next slide. Righto. So um, you've just heard Dave talk a bit about that, that process we went through with Task Caddy 1, one into 2. And we just wanted to put up a slide here a bit about the fact that, you know, we, the fact that we are primarily a consultancy, but, you know, we're trying to also yeah, build this product. And we've got plans for, you know, <laughs> we've got this sort of whiteboard at home where you know, it's got 10 things that we want to build over the next, you know, X amount of time. But it's this, this challenge of trying to build products while you're building a consultancy. And so we wanted to talk about a, a few of the things that we think causes, you know, issues here. And one is, you know, we're the, we're the client and we're, we're a difficult client, like, uh, because, you know, you, you want it to be, it's representing you as a business. You can't blame anybody else for it. And so, um, yeah, you, you, you keep you know, creeping the features. You, um, you know, you keep taking long time uh, for, for everything and so the um but also we tend to treat them differently to our other client projects so you you sort of say oh well um that's just something we're doing on the side and so it always it, it uh we don't you know set a clear plan for the development of that as a company that does products as their primary um like, like rea and the guys there you know they, they that's their product is is their business and so um so I think that's something we've learned as part of this process. But there's also this catch-22 about you know, you, you're uh, only going to get a revenue stream if you spend time on, your, on making a quality product. But um, you know, it's, it, the, the flip side of that is we need money in the door to survive. And so um, you keep prioritising uh, the, the client work. And so it's one of the interesting things is I spent 10 years at, a, at, at another consultancy um, working, for, um, working for another business, and we didn't have a single product in that 10-year period. But what's interesting about the iOS space, I think, is the fact that pretty much every consultancy I can think of goes for that sort of hybrid model in some form or another. So we're all faced with this type of with this type of challenge. And I'm interested, I guess, as part of the Q and A uh, question process at the end, uh, if people want to talk a bit about that as well. So, in conclusion, um, here's just a couple of points we wanted to sort of reiterate um, that you know we've certainly found that uh, relationships such as those built through communities like Coco Heads here have been far more important to us and and uh, the, the sort of modest success of, uh, or the survival really, of our business than, um, than you know, selling and, and the sort of um, cold calling and the types of traditional um, sales techniques. Um, have a clear identity, you know, know, know your target market and, uh, and, and be clear about the branding. Um, be flexible um, on the, you know, is sort of the converse to, to being clear about what you want to be. Be, be prepared to change because one of the things we found is all the plans we had uh, at the start and the, the way we thought things had, would go obviously uh, get torn up when, when they don't go according to plan and so be flexible. And, and one of the things we found is that 
the market is changing all the time. It's still really in its infancy. And so in terms of the future for the business, we're looking at uh, with a, a mate of ours is looking at potentially joining the business um, towards the end of the year. Uh, but really, we're just looking to keep moving forward. So um, on that note, I'll, uh, here's our contact details. If you want to um, speak to us after the presentation as well, we'll be happy to, happy to hear. But uh, I don't know, we open it up for questions, yeah, Sean, or do you want to? Many thanks to David and Scott for presenting this month. Thanks also to JTribe for hosting this month's event. JTribe develops apps for iPhone, iPad, and Android. You can get more information at jtribe.com.au. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, visit us on the web at melbournecocoaheads.com or follow Melbourne Cocoa on Twitter.